Uh, from time to time, we all ask some deep and difficult questions. Why is the world filled with woe? How can we make it better? Why, how do we give meaning and purpose to our lives? Well, as deep and difficult as these questions are, some people have answers to them. <laughs> For example, morality is dictated by God in holy scriptures. When everyone obeys his laws, the world will be perfect. Problems are the fault of evil people who must be shamed, punished, and defeated. Our tribe should claim its rightful greatness under the control of a strong leader who embodies its authentic virtue. In the past, we lived in a state of order and harmony until alien forces brought on decadence and degeneration. We must restore the society to its golden age. Well, what about the rest of us? <laughs> uh, in Enlightenment Now, I argue that there is an alternative system of beliefs and values. Uh, namely, the ideals of the Enlightenment. That uh, we can use knowledge to enhance human flourishing. Now, many people embrace the ideals of the Enlightenment without being able to name or describe them. As a result, they have faded into the background. Uh, they become just part of the status quo or the establishment. Now, other ideologies have passionate uh, advocates, and I believe that Enlightenment ideals, too, need a positive defense and, ex and an explicit commitment. And that's what I've tried uh, to do. The Enlightenment, um, I suggest, embraces four themes, reason, science, humanism, and progress. Let me say a few words about each. It all begins with reason. Reason is non-negotiable. As soon as you try to provide reasons why you should trust anything other than reason, uh, why you're right, why other people should believe you, that you're not lying or full of crap, you've lost the argument because you've appealed to reason. Now, human beings on their own are not particularly reasonable. Uh, cognitive psychologists have shown that we generalize from anecdotes, we reason from stereotypes, we seek evidence that confirms our beliefs and ignore evidence that disconfirms them, and we're overconfident about our knowledge, wisdom, and rectitude. But people are capable of reason if they establish certain norms and conventions. Free speech, open criticism and debate, logical analysis, fact-checking, and empirical testing. And that leads to the second Enlightenment ideal, science. Uh, science is based on the conviction that the world is intelligible, that we can understand the world by formulating possible explanations and testing them against reality. Now, science has shown to be our most reliable way of understanding the world, including ourselves. An important Enlightenment uh, theme was that there can be a science of human nature and that beliefs about society are testable, just like any other uh, empirical beliefs. The third value is humanism, that the ultimate moral purpose is to reduce the suffering and enhance the flourishing of human beings and uh, other sentient uh, creatures. Uh, this may seem obvious. Who could be against human flourishing? And the answer is uh, lots of people. There are, uh, there are distinct alternatives to humanism, such as that the ultimate good is to enhance the glory of the tribe, nation, race, class, or faith, to obey the dictates of a divinity and pressure others to do the same, to achieve feats of uh, heroic greatness, or to advance some, some mystical force, dialectic struggle, or pursuit of a utopian or messianic age. Now, humanism is feasible because people are endowed with a sense of sympathy, an ability to uh, feel a concern with the welfare of others. By default, our circle of sympathy, unfortunately, is rather small, and we tend to sympathize with our blood relatives, our trading partners, our friends and allies, and cute little fuzzy baby animals. But uh, our circle of sympathy can be expanded through uh, the forces of cosmopolitanism, the mixing of people and ideas. Uh, education, journalism, art, uh, mobility, and reason. As soon as you sit down and uh, have to come to an agreement with someone else, um, you can't maintain that uh, your interests are special just because you're you and they're not, and hope for them to take you seriously. Uh, and this leads to progress that uh, if we apply knowledge and sympathy to reduce suffering and enhance flourishing, uh, we can gradually succeed. Uh, so how did that enlightenment thing work out? Uh, if you ask most intellectuals, the answer is not very well. So I've learned that intellectuals hate progress, and intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. <laughs> 
Uh, if you think that we can solve problems, uh, you have a blind faith or, and a quasi-religious belief in the outmoded superstition of the false promise of a myth of the onward march of inevitable progress. You are a cheerleader for vulgar American can-doism with the rah-rah spirit of boardroom ideology, Silicon Valley, and the Chamber of Commerce. You are a practitioner of Whig history, a naive optimist, a Pollyanna, uh, or, or a Pangloss, an allusion to the Voltaire character who declared that all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Now, Pangloss, as it happened, was a pessimist. A true optimist believes the world can be much better than the one that we find ourselves in. But the question of whether we've made progress should not hinge on what kind of uh, temperament or, or myth you you, uh, temperament you have or myth you subscribe to, but it can be treated as an empirical hypothesis. Human well-being can be measured. Life, health, sustenance, prosperity, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, happiness. If they have increased over time, that is progress. Well, let's take a look, beginning with uh, life itself, the most uh, precious resource. For most of human history, life expectancy at birth uh, seldom deviated from around uh, 30 years. Um, but uh, starting with, uh, in the 18th century, with the advent of uh, public health and sanitation and uh, vaccines, life expectancy has increased uh, uh, worldwide to 70. In uh, developed countries, which made the escape from universal early death first, the uh, life expectancy at birth is 80. Here you see, uh, and uh, likewise with the Americas, uh, Asia, uh, after a lag, caught up. Uh, here we see the same thing happening with um, Africa. Um, one of the greatest contributors to shortened lifespan was the tragic death of children in the first five years of life. Uh, as recently as 200 years ago, uh, Sweden, which we consider one of the uh, most advanced um, countries in the world, um, had a child mortality rate of 33%. Uh, One third of Swedish children did not make it to the age of five. That was then uh, quickly brought down to very close to zero, a trajectory that then was followed by countries in uh, the Americas, such as Canada, South Korea in Asia, uh, Chile in uh, Latin America, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is now starting to close the gap. Ethiopia has reduced its rate of child mortality from almost 25% to less than 5%. Still too high, but the, it, it is continuing to fall. Uh, sustenance. Uh, the uh, approximate number of calories needed by an adult male is about 2,500, a uh, figure that England only began to reach with the agricultural revolution in the uh, 19th century, with uh, uh, developments in agronomy, crop rotation, uh, later selective breeding of vigorous hybrids. Uh, the United States followed a, uh, and France followed similar trajectories. More recently, uh, China is catching up. Here we see the trajectory for India and the world, uh, world as a whole. Now, one could say this is a dubious progress if it simply consists of the fat getting fatter. But uh, in fact, undernourishment, which as recently as 1970 um, struck uh, what 35% of children in the developing world has been brought, to, uh, cut down in half in just uh, 45 years. Uh, Latin America, which uh, had high rates, has brought it down even further. Here we see the trajectories for uh, Asia, and su Sub-Saharan Africa is beginning to fight back against hunger. Uh, as a result, death from famine, which was one of the horsemen of the apocalypse, never uh, far away from any region of the world, has been uh, reduced to only the most remote and war-torn uh, pockets. Uh, prosperity. For most of human history, there was uh, little to no economic growth. Uh, then with the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, uh, gross world product has increased 200-fold in the past 250 years. Once again, um, as with many uh, dimensions of improvement, the growth has been uneven. Uh, here we have, see that UK was one of the was the uh, first country to escape from universal um, poverty, and the uh, United States uh, exceeded it. South Korea was extremely poor until just a few decades ago, and is beginning to close the gap. Here we see a Latin American country, uh, Chile, and uh, China and India are starting to uh, show similar exponential growth in wealth. Uh, again, if it's was that. 
if that was just a question of the rich getting richer, it would be perhaps a dubious form of progress. But in fact, um, it's the poor that are getting, uh, uh, being lifted out of universal wretchedness. Uh, extreme poverty, defined by the World Bank as um, uh, living on $1.90 per person per day, the bare minimum to uh, feed one's family, has fallen from 90% of the world population 200 years ago to uh, less than 10% today. And the World Bank has set a goal of eliminating extreme poverty everywhere by the 2030s. So may we live to see that day. Uh, as a result, because poor countries are getting richer faster than rich countries are getting richer, international inequality uh, has been declining, even though inequality within rich countries has been increasing. But even within uh, rich countries, there's been a momentous development, which is that um, whereas in the, uh, through the 19th century, developed countries devoted perhaps 1.5% of their GDP to social transfers to the poor, the sick, the young, and the old. In every uh, developed country that uh, increased in the second half of the 20th century, and so now uh, on average, a developed country devotes uh, almost a quarter of its wealth to social transfers. Thanks to these social transfers, the rate of poverty um, in Western countries, such as the United States, has fallen. In 1960, uh, one third of Americans fell below the poverty line. Uh, that, when measured in terms of income after taxes, that has fallen to less than 10%. When measured in terms of what people can actually afford to buy, the poverty rate is less than 5%. Peace. For most of human history, war was the natural uh, state of international relations, and peace was a mere interlude between wars. You can see that in this graph, sorry, which shows the percentage of years that the great powers of the day, the major states and empires, were, uh, fought wars against each other. Uh, and what this graph shows is that 500 years ago, the great powers were pretty much always at war. Uh, today, they are virtually never at war. The last great war pitted the U.S. against China in uh, 1953. Now, if we zoom in on the uh, post-war period, uh, after World War II, we find that as recently as the early 1950s, uh, the Korean War and Chinese uh, Civil War um, killed about 20 people per 100,000 per year. And that has uh, fallen on a somewhat, something of a roller coaster, but with an unmistakable downward trajectory. Even the uptick from the recent uh, Syrian civil war has not brought the world back to the levels that it suffered through the 80s, 70s, uh, 60s, and, and 50s. Freedom and rights. Despite some uh, conspicuous and um, tragic backsliding in Turkey, Venezuela, and uh, Russia, the trajectory of the world is toward greater democracy. This is a composite scale of democracy versus autocracy across the world. And what it shows is that the world has never been more democratic. In the early 1970s, there were about uh, uh, th only 31 democracies in the entire world. Today, there are um, uh, 105. Uh, individual states have been uh, constrained in the uh, ability to brutalize their citizens. One example is the abolition of the death penalty, formerly uh, universal across the, the world. Now, um, uh, two countries on average abolish it every year, and uh, in the, if the current tra trajectory continues, capital punishment could vanish from the face of the earth in the 2020s. Uh, so another example is that homosexuality used to be criminalized in the vast majority of the world's countries, but uh, since the Enlightenment, country after country has decriminalized um, homosexuality, a trend that continues despite some of the conspicuous exceptions, such as uh, Russia and, and, and uh, Uganda. Uh, child labor. In uh, 1850, about a third of British children worked in um, farms, factories, and mills. Uh, in England and the US, thanks to compulsory schooling and uh, regulation of child labor, that fell to uh, close to zero. Uh, Italy later went on the same trajectory. And these two graphs show that the world as a whole is reducing the uh, rate of child labor. Violent crime. In uh, homicide statistics in many parts of Europe go back to the Middle Ages, literally to the 14th century. Uh, during which time the approximate homicide rate for Western Europe was about uh, 35 per 100,000 per year. 
Uh, that has been brought down in uh, countries like England and the Netherlands and Be Belgium to, to uh, less than one. Uh, trajectory later followed by Italy, by um, New England, uh, by the, uh, it, here you see that the American Wild West began with uh, massively high rates of violence, just like in the cowboy movies, and before that was brought under control. And even some of the notoriously violent parts of the world today, such as Mexico, which continue to have high rates of violent crime, but in the past their rates were uh, even higher and they're uh, following a similar trajectory. If we zoom in on the uh, last 50 years or so, we see that one of the exceptions to the um, trend of uh, low rates of violent crime. The United States has managed to bring its homicide rate down by half in the last 25 years. Uh, England saw a bit of an uptick from the 60s to the uh, early 2000s, but that has been reversed as well. And here we have a graph for the world as a whole showing that the uh, world has reduced its homicide rate by uh, about 30% in the last um, three decades. Uh, it's not just the most extreme crime of homicide that has been in decline, but uh, violence against women, uh, such as domestic violence, rape, and sexual assault have been declining. And indeed, we've be become safer in uh, every way. Uh, over the course of the 20th century, there has been a 96% uh, reduction in the chance of being killed in a car accident, a 95% reduction in the chance of being mowed down on the sidewalk if you're a pedestrian, 99% reduction in the chance of dying in a plane crash, um, a similarly dramatic reduction in the chance of being killed on the job, uh, drastically reduced chances of dying in a flood, fire, earthquake, volcano, or other um, so-called act of God. And what about the ultimate act of God, the literal bolt from the blue, the, everyone's favorite metaphor for a, an unpredictable date with death? Well, yes, Americans are 96% li less likely to be killed by a bolt of lightning. <laughs> Knowledge. Uh, the, for most of European history, at most 15% of the population could read or write. That quickly went to 100% in uh, Europe, and um, including Germany and Italy, the United States. That trajectory is now being followed by the rest of the world. Here you, you see uh, Chile, Mexico, uh, and the world as a whole. At, uh, currently about 80% of the world is literate and about 90% of the children. And uh, as a result of gains in education and uh, health and longevity, um, as, as incredible as it may seem, we've been getting smarter. In a phenomenon known as the Flynn effect, IQ scores have been rising uh, by about three points a decade for uh, a century in every uh, part of the world. Does this actually uh, improve our quality of life? Well, in uh, just about any way that you want to measure, it has. Uh, in Europe and the United States, a, more than a century ago, the typical work week was uh, about 62 hours. That has been reduced by 22 hours, and on average, workers have three weeks of paid vacation. Uh, thanks to the penetration of running water, electricity, washing machines, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, dishwashers, stoves, and microwaves, the amount of time that people spend doing housework has fallen from uh, more than 60 hours a week to, um, uh, uh, to 11 hours a week. And when I say people, I mean predominantly women, since housework uh, continues to be so uh, gendered. So entire uh, tranches of human life have been returned to uh, women thanks to the uh, uh, penetration of labor-saving devices. Uh, thanks to these developments, we have the shortened work week and the reduced time wasted on housework. The amount of leisure time has uh, increased in the last 50 years for men and for women. The reason that women's uh, amount of leisure time actually dipped uh, starting in the 1980s is that women today spend more time with their children. Uh, a uh, single working mother today spends more time with her children than a stay-at-home married mother did in the 1950s. Well, does it make us any happier, uh, all of these measurable improvements? Well, if you, we don't have figures for the world as a whole, but we do know that happiness is related to uh, income. This is a, the regression line for uh, <coughs> uh, average national happiness uh, assessed by the simple expedient of asking people 
how happy are you, uh, as a function of the log of uh, GDP. Um, and I chose that the richer the country, the happier its citizens. This swarm of points show uh, where each dot represents a country and each arrow represents the distribution of happiness within the country shows that within countries, the higher the income, the happier the person. Um, and so as countries get richer, as all countries uh, have been doing, it means that on average, their citizens have, are uh, getting happier. Well, how are all these facts of human progress reflected in the news? Well, here's just uh, one, one more graph. This uses an algorithmic technique called sentiment mapping to uh, assess the overall degree of uh, positive versus negative affect in a typical news story. Um, and what it shows is the New York Times has been getting uh, increasingly morose over all those decades in which life has been getting better. And a sample of the world's broadcast shows a uh, similar uh, trajectory toward gloominess. So why do people deny progress? One explanation uh, uh, invokes a quirk of our psychology called the availability heuristic. Namely, we, people estimate risk according to how easily they recall examples from memory. Now, that can get fed by a feature of the news. Namely, news is about stuff that happens, not about stuff that doesn't happen. You never see a correspondent saying, here I am reporting live from a country that's at peace, or from a city that has not been struck by terrorists today. Uh, if you combine the uh, nature of news, which is that it will serve up the uh, glorious events as long as they haven't fallen to zero, with the availability heuristic, and you get the impression that the world is getting more dangerous and uh, always has been. Also, there's a feature of our psychology called the negativity bias. Bad is stronger than good. We think about and feel bad events more than good, than good ones, and we are constantly uh, vigilant to risks and threats and dangers, which opens up a niche for professional uh, pessimists and, and curmudgeons and prophets and doomsayers to remind us of threats we may have overlooked, uh, giving rise to the prophecy market in which uh, pessimism sounds serious and optimism sounds frivolous. Well, let me end with uh, some questions about um, uh, optimism and progress. Uh, you, you could legitimately ask, isn't it uh, good to be pessimistic, to uh, be vigilant against threats, to uh, speak truth to power, to hold the powerful uh, accountable? The answer is no, it's good to be accurate. Uh, we obviously need to be aware of suffering and, and injustice where they occur, but we also have to be avail uh, aware of how they can be reduced, because um, thoughtless pessimism uh, brings with it its own dangers, the danger of fatalism. Why throw um, good, uh, good money after bad? Why waste time and money on a hopeless cause? And it can lead to radicalism. To, uh, if the current uh, establishment is so hopeless at, and, and if we're in, uh, always in deepening crisis, then the only solution would seem to be to smash the machine, drain the swamp, burn the empire to the ground, empower a um, demagogue who claims only I can fix it, uh, in the hope that anything must be better than what we have now. Uh, is progress inevitable? And the answer is, of course not. Uh, solutions create new problems, um, and we can always be blindsided by nasty surprises, like the world wars, the 1960s crime boom, AIDS in Africa, or the opioid <laughs> epidemic in the United States uh, today. Um, also, we face severe global challenges, climate change and nuclear weapons which uh, we are unsolved, but we can look at them as uh, problems to be solved um, in the future as we've solved problems in the past through decarbonization of the economy and denuclearization of the world's armed forces. Um, believe it or not, there has been progress toward each one. Uh, this graph shows the amount of CO2 that the nations of the world have to emit to produce a uh, dollar of GDP, which has uh, peaked in the 1960s. Traje trajectory that industrializing countries tend to undergo. Uh, here you see what, that the UK, as it switched from uh, wood uh, to coal to oil to gas and uh, renewables, it peaked in its emissions of uh, carbon per um, unit of uh, wealth created. The United States peaked a bit later. Uh, China has recently peaked, and here we see that uh, India has gone through that transition. Now, these have to be brought to zero, which will be extraordinarily difficult, but what this graph shows is that it is a, uh, there exists a process which we can accelerate. 
Uh, likewise, nuclear weapons um, have uh, the nuclear arsenal has been reduced by 85% since its peak in the 1980s. And despite um, constant warnings that nuclear war is just around the, the corner, a nuclear taboo uh, has largely been in, has been completely been in place since 1945, and no nuclear weapon has been uh, detonated in warfare since the extraordinary circumstances of the closing uh, days of World War II. Uh, final question, does, uh, does the Enlightenment somehow go against human nature, as many cultural conservatives and um, defenders of religion and nationalism uh, avow? Is, is humanism somehow arid or tepid or flattened? Is the conquest of disease, famine, poverty, violence, and ignorance boring? <laughs> uh, do people need to believe in magic? a father in the sky, a strong chief to protect the tribe, myths of heroic ancestors. Uh, I don't think so. For one thing, secular liberal democracies are the happiest and healthiest places on earth, and they are the chief destination of people who vote with their feet. And uh, I dare say that applying knowledge and sympathy to enhance human flourishing is heroic, glorious, uh, and spiritual. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so uh, this is a fantastic book, and uh, I enormously enjoyed reading it. It's one that I will be returning to time and again. And, and one of the challenging things about asking questions about the book is that you don't just make your case, but you also then systematically in every chapter rebut every possible criticism that could be made um, of your case. So when I, when I raise questions, I don't want anyone to believe that the questions I raise are not questions which Stephen himself addresses and deals with in the book, but I'm just trying to illuminate some of the kind of more prevalent criticisms of the book from those who've read it, and that seems to me particularly from those who haven't actually uh, read it. Um, so, so let me start with one. Is, the, um, is there any circularity to the argument, which is that you praise the liberal enlightenment by judging it on liberal enlightenment grounds, but our grounds, the way in which we judge progress might change. If in 20 years, in the middle of climate chaos, we might say, well, actually, the growth of affluence and freedom was a disaster for the human race. We might, in 20 years, decide that abortion and euthanasia were a form of murder, and that will throw your violent statistics uh, up in the air. So is there a, uh, could our view of progress change radically, do you think? Yeah. Well, in, in, if, if, there are, um, if the world doesn't deal with climate change and then there are disasters, that doesn't involve a change in criteria because its costs would be measured in, in human flourishing. If people are displaced, if they're starved, if, they, uh, if there are epidemics, if there's conflict, then that would be a, a reversal by the very same standards. Um, but it, it is true that the, um, in other cases, there may be uh, contestable criteria, perhaps uh, authenticity uh, or spirituality or uh, glory uh, are what we ought to aim for, even if it uh, uh, results in uh, human beings as collateral damage. There, um, so um, it's not so much uh, circular because I, um, I do argue that if we, uh, to the extent that we prioritize human well-being, then progress consists of, of uh, uh, enhancements in, in uh, those dimensions. But I also point out that, that people tend to um, get pushed toward those very values uh, whenever they have to agree on values at all. The problem with values like uh, national glory is that uh, not all nations can have them at once, especially if it's defined at each other's expense, or religious, the truth of religious uh, doctrines. And there's a, a, a natural, I think, evolution in values toward humanism as we become a more global community, which is something that is uh, impossible to reverse, and people just have to um, figure out how, how, how to get along. And the example that I gave was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, where in the process leading to the uh, drafting uh, and, and ratification of uh, it, the question arose, I mean, could, it, could you possibly get a set of principles that the entire world would agree on? I mean, you've got the, the, your Christians and your Hindus and your Confucians uh, and, um, and, and your, your, your Muslims. Uh, you've got people speaking incompatible languages. This is just uh, the, 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 the uh, common denominator between all of them must be, be zero. And so uh, UNESCO, through Jacques Maritain, um, convened actually a council of 
religious and uh, philosophical and uh, uh, cultural thinkers from the world's cultures, and just ask them, if you had to uh, submit some uh, ideas for a universal declaration that the world would agree on, what would be on your list? I found that the list was the same, from the Confucians and from the Muslims and from the, uh, the, the Catholics, uh, the things like um, uh, human freedom, um, human health, uh, education. Uh, when it comes down to it, as soon as you are tasked with coming up with something that other people have to agree to, uh, you're, you're all pushed in, in that direction. So that doesn't completely answer the question because you could, you could still have, and, and history has shown that sometimes particular tribes arise that say, well, we're just going to impose our greatness uh, on the world and everyone else can screw themselves. Um, but we also know what tends to happen to those, um, uh, th those movements. They tend to get defeated uh, simply because they, by definition, if they uh, enhance a parochial value like their own glory, the entire rest of the world gets pitted against them. And uh, you know, they might predominate for a while, but probably not indefinitely. By the way, I should mention for abortion, abortion rates peaked in about 1980, and there's been a decline in uh, uh, abortions. Um, I, I sense reading the book that part of the inspiration for it was your exasperation with some of the responses to the previous book that you'd written. And so uh, let me revive the criticism of, of, of that book, which is, which was, isn't the very project, as it were, of patting ourselves on the back for our progress a, a strange thing to do when there are still people who lived through Hitler, Mao, Stalin, when what is happening in Syria is still unfolding? Isn't there something problematic about wanting to congratulate ourselves in such circumstances? Well, it's, it's not self-congratulation. It's recognizing what works and what doesn't work. I mean, it's kind of like saying, well, isn't, it, um, uh, isn't there something bad about... Um, uh, adopting uh, cancer treatments that are uh, largely effective because they don't save everyone. Uh, as until we save every last person, we should save no one. Let, let them all die, because otherwise we might be congratulating ourselves on the ones that we saved. Uh, I don't think that's a rational response. I think the rational response is, to the extent that we've actually uh, achieved good, let's uh, learn about it so that we can do more of it. Now, uh, the, the last thing I would do is question any of your statistics, but I, I did kind of wonder on one of your graphs whether if it was right up to date it would still be going in the right direction, and that was the one about democracy. So what I've been reading recently is actually the number of democracies has been in decline, and certainly what feels like the state of the democracy in those democracies which exist feels kind of problematic. We see the rise of populism, and that's not just in one or two countries. It is a broad uh, uh, uptick. Do you think that this is just a passing phase, or is there something deeper that we ought to be worrying about? Uh, we, uh, um, we definitely should be worried about it, but that doesn't mean that it's a passing, that, well, that, that which um, you know, doesn't guarantee that it'll be a passing phase. But the, um, the graph that I showed, which was through 2016, um, does show a leveling off. The, the uh, organization that claims that there's been a decline is uh, Freedom House. And um, I have a general rule of thumb in, in uh, appealing to statistics, which is never use statistics from a website that has a donate button on top. Uh, <laughs> because those, uh, the business model of those nonprofits and, and uh, charities is to whip up uh, uh, f fear and, uh, and dread and concern. And uh, Freedom House's measure, I think, is, um, is, is uh, their message is uh, almost always uh, alarmist and, and catastrophic. It is true that there have been uh, setbacks to democracy in, in Russia, in Turkey, in Venezuela, in Eastern Europe, in the United States. Um, and um, the, uh, but we have to put that against, before we uh, call it, as so many pundits have done, a democratic meltdown and recession and erosion, you've got to keep, keep in mind uh, what a high uh, baseline that is a, a, a plateauing of, or even if it's a bit of a decline, that in, uh, in the memory of many people in, in this room, uh, half of Europe was behind the Iron Curtain, Spain and Portugal were fascist dictatorships, uh, Greece was a military junta, there was barely a single democracy in Latin America, they were all military, um, as, as they used to call them, banana republics. Um, uh, uh, Taiwan and um, uh, South Korea were, were pretty much military dictatorships. So the, um, the, the uh, rise continued through the uh, 1990s, through the first decade of the 21st century. And so we're really very close to, if not at, the uh, peak for democracy in all of human history. 
Uh, in, as, as I said, in, the, in 1971, there were only 31 democracies. And then, I think it was one had the, le the legitimate prospect of democracy, just as Daniel Patrick Moynihan put it, being in the condition of monarchy. That is, uh, it's a, a nice while, while it lasted, but uh, its days were numbered. And history has shown that that hasn't been true. The democracy is more robust than, uh, than, than, the, than the cynics uh, feared. So it, it can be slightly daunting asking Stephen questions, as you can see. But, um, uh, so therefore, I'm giving you a warning that in five minutes, I'm going to be asking you to do that. So start thinking about what you can ask. I've only got two questions left before I open it up. Um, I hear what you're saying about democracy, Stephen. But, but, but part of my worry is that possibly the rise of populism, the problems of democracy, to do with the fact that the world is an increasingly complex pace. And you know, you, amongst your many... Uh, uh, um, uh, distinctions, your cognitive psychologist. I'm wondering, do you feel that human beings are able to cope with the complexity of the modern world? And what no. is the evidence of our capacity growing to deal with that undoubted complexity? Yeah, no, it, it is a legitimate question. And I don't want to downplay the threats to democracy that we've seen with the rise of, of uh, populism, because I, un unquestionably, uh, countries like um, Turkey and, and uh, Russia are becoming more uh, authoritarian, sometimes brutally so. Um, and the entire movement of authoritarian populism does represent a kind of uh, resurgence of some of the darker uh, sides of human nature in the face of the much far more um, subtle and complex institutions of the Enlightenment. Um, in, in many ways, uh, authoritarian populism is uh, the, the latest of a set of counter-Enlightenment movements, um, tribalist, authoritarian, um, demonizing, uh, sometimes magical, that, uh, that are pushing back against the rather intricate apparatus that, uh, that, that, uh, that we've enjoyed since the, the Enlightenment. For example, the idea that uh, a leader should embody the uh, authentic virtue of the people directly and not have to bother with all that messiness of democratic procedures and checks and balances. So that is an example of something that's complex, namely the procedures of a liberal democracy against something that is more simple and intuitive, namely the people are inherently worthy, the leader uh, embodies its authentic virtue uh, directly. Um, so I think it much depends on how we frame uh, the accomplishments of the Enlightenment in commentary, in journalism, in education. I do think that we've been um, kind of remiss at, at uh, celebrating what has worked. Uh, that, like the rule of law, like democratic governance, like regulated markets, um, and we've kind of let it fade into the background. Um, and if the gifts of the Enlightenment are not particularly intuitive. They're, they're not um, they're by no means natural. They're sometimes difficult to appreciate. And it should be part of our uh, continuing effort to make it part of our conventional wisdom why we have things like, like rule of law. Uh, as opposed to you know, mob justice. But do we have to intellectually evolve to cope with the nature of the modern world? I think particularly of technology, it often feels that te the pace of technological change is so much faster than the, ta the, ta the, the pace of cultural adaptation. Yes, and uh, ideally the technology would um, evolve in service of exactly those aspects of complexity the human mind has trouble keeping uh, up with. And I, I have in mind, in, in, um, for example, the... Uh, uh, greater accessibility and um, transparency of data. That uh, since we, um, the best way to understand a society is not through vivid anecdotes and compelling narratives, but also through graphs like how many wars have there been over time, how many people uh, are killed in um, homicides and terrorist attacks, and a, a more numerate culture, um, including a culture of journalism, more technological. Um, uh, uh, assistance to human cognition in the form of um, tantalizing data graphics, interactive graphics available on websites so that we can, when an empirical question comes up, uh, a person without a statistics degree can go to one of these sites and just see the graph pop up. Um, people, uh, Hans Rosling, the, the late Swedish doctor, uh, who has a, a number of viral TED Talks, was a, a master at doing this at um, showing uh, human historical trajectories in graphic form in a way that was uh, intuitively compelling. Um, Max Rose's website, Our, Web in, Our, Our World in Data, is a way of, um, kind of getting a visualization of the state of the world in just about any dimension that one would want to check. Um, and so, yes, we do have to 
uh, deploy technology to augment our puny cognitive processes to cope with this massive world of uh, information. I'm sensing you wouldn't have a great deal of sympathy for our leading politician who suggest, suggested we've had enough of experts. I, I, I have heard of that. No, I would not have uh, sympathy with him, no. Um, That's right. Okay, so let's take, uh, we'll take them two or three questions together. Let's start with, uh, first, wait for the microphone to come to you, and if you could tell us your name, that would be great. We'll do a uh, question, then answer. Not, not question, 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 answer, answer, answer. Right. Your, uh, Stephen, I defer to you. Yes. Whatever answer. your preferred method is, is absolutely fine. Uh, it's the woman in yes, front so of you first. Sorry. In my pessimism, I really am seeking accuracy, if I can. Do you think that the Enlightenment is problematic, that it can be very blinding and condescending, and also it can be burden, like freedom is? And my, my fear is that very often in history, it, it resulted in destruction of self and others. Thank you. Um, no, uh, I think that enlightenment, for example, in um, uh, calling for empowerment of people as opposed to authoritarian governments is the opposite of condescending. Uh, it is saying that, the, the, that, that uh, the, the voice of the people have to be taken into account in governance, for example. It's saying that the um, well-being of people uh, is the ultimate good, not rather than subordinating people to the glory of the, uh, of the king or the, or the tribe. Um, and uh, and I, uh, since the fruits of the Enlightenment include longer lives and, and better education and greater rights for women and, and um, minorities, uh, that uh, it, it's um, uh, enhanced lives rather than, than uh, diminished. In fact, that's the whole point, is to enhance the lives of uh, individual people. I think it's rather that um, authoritarian regimes uh, are the ones that, that uh, quash the um, well-being of the individual. So if I was an auctioneer and I was selling questions, I could get very, very rich now. So uh, <laughs> there are loads of hands, and we've only got about eight minutes. So please keep your questions as brief as you can. Yes. Uh, hi, my name's Damien Morris. Uh, thank you, Professor Pinker, for your, for your presentation. I'm looking forward to reading another one of your uh, wonderful paradigm-shifting books. Uh, my question is about politics. Um, you've recently been mischaracterized as a supporter of the old right, uh, despite, from, uh, from memory, you openly endorsed Hillary Clinton during the presidential race. Um, uh, I've also heard thinkers like uh, Jonathan Haidt to describe you as a libertarian, but that doesn't seem to match with your endorsement of high social spending in one of your charts recently. Um, I wondered if you could summarize your political philosophy and perhaps name some of the modern uh, 20th century uh, thinkers that have most influenced you. You've got a minute for that, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm politically eclectic. I, I, I think that uh, we should treat politics the way a, a scientist treats uh, hypotheses, namely that policies should be evaluated not uh, a priori based on how, how uh, plausible they are, but by, by their results. We should be uh, open-minded. Um, and what the data seem to tell us is that uh, um, free markets with regulation and social spending uh, seem to be the form of uh, economic and political uh, system that would, uh, results in the, the greatest uh, peace, happiness, and, and uh, welfare. Uh, that uh, we, we know that um, capitalist societies are much better places to live than uh, communist societies. Uh, we have experimental and control groups like North Korea and South Korea, uh, East Germany and West Germany, uh, right now Venezuela and Chile. Uh, where the culture can be held constant, the geography, the resources, and we just know that one economic system really is better than the other. Better not just at uh, generating wealth, but also at freedom, happiness, uh, and other dimensions of human flourishing. At the same time, we also know that there's just no such thing as a uh, kind of a libertarian utopia of a uh, wealthy uh, democracy without extensive social spending and regulation. And there, there are good reasons that that should be true, even a priori, but a posteriori, we just know that those are the societies that uh, people want to move to. Those are the societies that by almost any measure are good societies, such as the uh, um, advanced democracies of uh, Northern and Western Europe. Back row. I'd like to ask you about modern slavery. Um, why, why do you think that's maybe kind of slipped through the, well, it has slipped through the net and is growing. Um, but more importantly, how do you think one could apply your um, ideas and thoughts to yeah. It's not well, clear that it's, it's growing, by the way. I don't, I don't know of any data that's showing that it shows that it's growing. 
Um, in fact, as a percentage of the world's population, the, uh, the portion of slaves is almost certainly at an all-time low. And of course, it, together with uh, trafficking and, and uh, illegal slavery, and all slavery now is illegal, for most of human history, slavery was legal. It was supported by, by law and uh, by uh, enforcement. It's no surprise why uh, uh, people should want to have slaves. They're the ultimate labor-saving device. Um, and so we have not managed to uh, eliminate it from pockets of the world that are beyond the, re the reach of the law. But the world's nations have agreed that slavery is, is an evil, and that's uh, an important start. It needs to be in enforced to the extent that we can through activism, through uh, uh, enforcement of existing laws. And it's a, uh, I have every reason to believe that it will continue to decline because the, uh, the world has come to a, a consensus that it is an evil. Thank you. Yep. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Mike Frank. Uh, I live a mile from here in what was once very poor, Clerkenwell, and now is increasingly rich. But the poor people who are still locked in here seem to characterize what seems to be happening in cities everywhere where the very rich and the poor are together in cities, but the poor are trapped. I do not see enlightenment from the metropolitan elite going far enough to redeem the problems that the people around me, the poor people around me, can um, embrace the optimism that you're expressing. Uh, they're going for the pessimism. It's very hard to get them to be involved in anything that happens in the area now. Thank you. One of, just to say that one of the speeches that we've had in the last couple of years that, that had a big impact um, was Robert Putnam's book about, called Our Kids, I think, in which he kind of argued that we've moved from a world where we cared about children in general to a world where we only care about our own children. And the kind of sense that the better off and the rich have become increasingly kind of uncaring about their less uh, privileged brethren. So what's your view on that? I mean, I think that that, uh, that has been happening, particularly in, in the uh, United States and, and to uh, a lesser extent in the UK. Um, and it's uh, something to to um, uh, push back against, that, that we need um, policies that uh, make up for the natural tendency of information economies to um, have some sectors of the uh, population uh, prosper far, far more than others. Uh, so it's, 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 a, a, um, uh, it's important to realize that, when, that the existence of progress doesn't mean that there are no problems left, that everything is perfect for everyone. Um, and so, um, you know, I often get, well, what about this problem? What about that problem? Well, I don't have a solution to all the world's problems. But Shame on the, you. <laughs> yeah, but the point is that that's not what progress consists of. Uh, if you think that progress consists of a utopia where everyone is happy, then you nev could never acknowledge any improvement because no improvement is going to consist of that. So yes, of course, there are, there are still problems. There are sectors of the population that, that need uh, additional care and attention. Uh, but that doesn't ne negate the, uh, the fantastic improvements that we've enjoyed, including the poor people in uh, developed countries. Um, one bit of evidence that um, the, the uh, fate of the poor people in developed countries is, uh, uh, has been an improvement is that so much of the rest of the world would, is very eager to become a uh, poor person in a, in a rich country. Uh, it's better to be a poor person in a rich country than a poor person in a poor country because there's uh, uh, health care and nutrition and education that as, uh, uh, as unhappy as these uh, uh, people may sometimes feel, um, you know, unquestionably, they're better off than their ancestors 50 years ago, as measured by poverty, as measured by longevity, as measured by malnutrition, uh, and, and so on. It's not to blow off the, the, uh, the discontent, but, it's, but to put it into context of uh, problems that we can take on and, uh, and try to solve going forward. So time for two more before I scarf up from the room, before I get lynched by all people I haven't called. Uh, there's a gentleman there. Hello, my name is Vincent. I'm a student here in London. Um, I'm also an optimist, but I want to ask you about another problem. Um, <laughs> regarding the kind of future trends in, in human happiness, I think that's one of, the, one of your uh, measures, which I think the, the way to measure it is still very difficult. So I ask you, what do you say to people like Sherry Turkle at MIT, who say that the way technology, particularly modern technologies like the internet, Bitcoin, are currently being used, especially by young people, are having a net negative effect upon kind of psychological well-being since we 
interact less with other people and rely most on our smartphones. Thank you. I mean, but a, a lot of the, there, there is a, a current um, kind of panic about the effect of uh, technology, particularly smartphones and particularly social media. Uh, a lot of it is shown to be, uh, I think, quite overblown. The idea that there's a crisis of uh, mental health in, uh, among younger people doesn't survive fact checking. That, uh, in fact, the, uh, by many measures, the millennial generation is uh, happier and mental, mentally healthier than their baby boomer parents. Um, there are some reports of, a, of an uh, increase in depression in the last five years uh, with the uh, advent of social media, but it's actually very hard to disentangle that from the uh, effects of the financial crisis of uh, 2008. And in fact, even the decline that has been claimed is a decline of, uh, when, it, when it's actually plotted on a, uh, on a graph, it's barely detectable. It's only when you blow the graph up that, uh, that this um, supposed incre uh, uh, in increase in uh, depression, uh, which fueled the moral panic, is even visible. So um, I, you know, I think it's something of concern. I think there should be limits on how much time people spend on, on social media, imposed either by parents when it comes to children or by kind of conventional wisdom of how to lead, lead a balanced life that is starting to proliferate through the culture as we become more aware of uh, the uh, overuse of um, social media and, and uh, the kind of addiction to um, um, gadgets. But it has not led to uh, a, any kind of uh, crisis or, or major change in level of happiness when it's objectively measured. And finally? It's uh, Kirsty Gogan, Energy for Humanity. Um, uh, yeah, so my question is about climate change, um, eco-modernism versus environmentalism, um, and really the question um, is the sort of tribal tendency of environmentalism to oppose the safest form of electricity generation that we have, which is um, seen as being the most dangerous, nuclear power, going to actually prevent us from making significant efforts to solve climate change? Uh, I mean, that, that is a, a fear, and you've expressed a a, uh, uh, an opinion similar to one that I develop in the chapter on, in, on the environment uh, in the book, which is that the, uh, what my co-author and I have called an inconvenient truth for the uh, environmental movement, <laughs> that the, uh, the most safest, most uh, uh, scalable, and most available form of zero carbon energy is nuclear power, and that uh, the tendency in countries like Germany and in states like California to shut down perfectly well-functioning nuclear power plants has led in 100% of cases to an increase in carbon emissions because nuclear uh, plants, when they're closed, they're always replaced by fossil fuel uh, plants. So I do think that this is a, a, a problem. I've um, tried to, to, to spread the word that if we're serious about climate change, then we have to, and we're serious about allowing the developing world to develop, which means ac access to abundant energy then uh, nuclear power has to be uh, part of the solution. Um, and, and if it isn't, we, there, 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 there could very well be severe problems down the line. So just finishing, I, 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 someone asked me to ask you this final question, which is, they suggested that perhaps your next book would be called, Oh My God, How Often Do I Have to Explain This Stuff to You All? Um, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I, I don't think you'd be as, uh, you know, I don't think you'd do so I, What is the next book? If... Uh, it's, um, this one came out just three days ago, so it's kind of daunting to think about the next one. But uh, I, I'm pondering, um, looking at the phenomenon uh, called common knowledge, where uh, I know something, you know something, I know that you know it, you know that I know it, I know that you know that I know that you know it, um, as a major phenomenon in human psychology and human public life, including the uh, rise of uh, culture of um, uh, shaming and public denunciation, of um, market bubbles, of fads and fashions, of self-conscious emotions. I think there are a lot of uh, phenomena that all can be uh, explained under this game theoretic concept of uh, common knowledge. Brilliant. Well, we look, we look forward to it. Um, uh, Stephen, you, you, you could spend your entire life, 24 hours a day, uh, speaking to audiences around the world. So we're delighted that once again you chose to come here to uh, the RSA. Uh, Stephen uh, is able to stay for a little while and sign uh, copies of his wonderful book outside uh, due to the fact that there'll be a lot of people buying it and not much time you may have to resist the desire to ask for selfies uh, or to engage Stephen in further philosophical debate but just get your book signed and move on um, it just remains for me to uh, ask you to join me in thanking Stephen Pinker <laughs> <laughs>